And very consistently, even though those heat stress gestating sows um, are heat stress, they will finish their feed every single day. It's going to be a diurnal pattern. It gets cooler at night. And so they're going to eat their full allocation. And But we're still seeing this increase in growth compared to our thermoneutral animals. And so what we believe is happening is that there's some difference in the energetic requirements of those heat stress gestating sows compared to our thermoneutral ones. And it's likely coming from the energy requirements for maintaining body temperature or, or that thermogenic component of that animal's energy requirements. Welcome to the Swine Health Black Belt Podcast, the latest Swine Health research digested for you. My name is Dr. Clayton Johnson. I'm the host of the podcast. And joining me on this week's episode is Dr. Jay Johnson. Dr. Johnson is an associate professor of stress physiology and animal welfare at the University of Missouri. Dr. Johnson, thank you so much for coming back on the podcast. And Jay, just in case folks didn't catch the first episode, why don't you introduce yourself to the audience? Well, thanks, and I appreciate being here. Uh, it's nice to be back talking to you here to, today, Clayton. Um, so, yeah, like you mentioned, I'm a associate professor focused in the area of uh, stress physiology and animal welfare at University of Missouri. Um, primary focus is really pigs. Um, do quite a bit of work on the in the heat stress area, particularly focused on uh, development of technologies and under better understanding thermal thresholds for heat stress in pigs. Um, we've been doing some work as well, looking at bioenergetic requirements of pigs under heat stress, as well as some ongoing work on uh, genomic tools and technologies to actually select pigs that might be more thermotolerant under heat stress conditions while maintaining that normal level of production. Salmonella presents significant challenges to pig health and performance and poses food safety risks to humans. As the first and only vaccine offering live attenuated strains of both Salmonella cholera suis and Typhimurium, Enterosol Salmonella TC from Boringer Ingelheim protects pigs against both serotypes with a single oral dose. Talk to your Boringer Ingelheim representative to learn more. Well, let's get right into it. What have you learned, uh, particularly on the gestating sow side of things, when it comes to bioenergetics, bioenergetics, selection to try and optimize performance in heat stress situations? What sort of information are you guys working on in the university and what should our producers know about it? Well, yeah. So, I mean, you know, over the last probably decade, you know, we've been really interested in how that heat load um, impacts our gestating sows, both that gestating sow and her reproductive performance but also how it's going to impact your offspring later on down the line. Um, one of the things we've seen really consistently, though, with some of this research is when we expose these gestating sows to heat stress, um, we find very consistently that they actually seem to grow a lot faster than those ones that we expose to thermoneutral conditions, which is really contrary to what we might normally think of when we think of heat stress exposure, right? Generally, we'll think, well, a pig under heat stress, it's probably going to grow a bit slower, right? It eats less, just less energy taken in to support that growth. But when we think about how we raise our gestating sows, right, we're always limiting, limit feeding them, right? We're feeding them to maintenance. And so we're essentially capping how much energy both of these groups can take in. And very consistently, even though those heat stress gestating sows um, are heat stress, they will finish their feed every single day. It's going to be a diurnal pattern. It gets cooler at night. And so they're going to eat their full allocation. And But we're still seeing this increase in growth compared to our thermoneutral animals. And so what we believe is happening is that there's some difference in the energetic requirements of those heat stress gestating sows compared to our thermoneutral ones. And it's likely coming from the energy requirements for maintaining body temperature or, or that thermogenic component of that animal's energy requirements. And so what we see is, again, we see the increase in growth and much of this growth we find is put into back fat, right? In some studies, we've seen almost a 300% increase in back fat from the start to the end of our heat loads. And generally when we're applying these different heat stress challenges, we're looking at it in that first half of gestation from about day six post-breeding until around day 60. When we look and see how it's impacting the developing fetuses, we actually don't see much difference in reproductive tract development between those two animals. And so they're not partitioning 
that extra growth into their developing fetuses, into those piglets, it's really all just going on their back, right? And so um, one of our interests is seeing, you know, could we actually quantify what those differences in energy requirements are for thermogenesis? And if we could, would we be able to better, more precisely feed these gestating sows during these summer months based on the expected temperatures they may be exposed to, right? So, you know, so that we're not essentially, you know, wasting feed that that animal doesn't really need to meet its baseline requirements. When you think about a population, Jay, let's just say normal barn situation, no, you know, normal summer heat. What percentage of the normal gestating population is really sensitive to that heat stress? You know what? Uh, when people think about changing the energy requirements and stuff like that, is that going to have a positive impact on every animal in the barn? Is it just a continuum that, you know, some animals that will help one percent and some animals that will help ninety nine percent? Or is it more black and white that no, there's like 20 percent of the animals that need that? The other 80 percent, nothing's going to change. How does all that work? No, oh, that's, that's a really good question. And that's actually one where we're hoping to answer here starting this fall. We have a, a study that we've designed and we, we were lucky enough to get it funded. And what we'll be doing is looking at uh, sow populations, uh, both during that early half of gestation as well as late half of gestation, exposed to varying heat loads of, you know, a mild heat challenge, a moderate or a severe or just even thermoneutral conditions. And what we really want to understand is, are there particular phases of gestation where they would be more or would be less affected by this potential change in either energetic requirements or that interaction with that heat load? And so what we hope to actually discover from this is, you know, say we have a population of animals that have just been bred and they're going to be, you know, starting in June or July here in North America Maybe we'd want to feed those animals a little bit differently compared to ones that have been bred perhaps back in April and are entering that late gestation phase in that June, July time period, right? And so I don't think it's going to be a, a linear response. I don't think it's probably going to be a consistent response. I think that there's going to be several different factors we need to consider. One of those even being what parity that animal is in, right? And so when we see these differences in growth rate, we actually find a much greater difference in growth for our replacement gills, for our nulliparous sows. We see that that difference is really exacerbated where those animals are growing a lot more than our ones that are under normal conditions. Now, our multiparous animals, they'll also grow a lot more, a lot faster, but it's about half the rate of growth increase as compared to our, to our replacement gills. Well, and I think that kind of leads into the genetic selection part of it. Um, you know, are we able to just select for more heat tolerant animals by just looking at the phenotype and kind of the classic, you know, indexing we do with number total born, number weaned, uh, breed back, all that stuff? Or is it more of a molecular approach where we know exactly where in the genome we need to go and, and put emphasis on to select for thermal tolerance? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think that's how we've traditionally looked at it, right? When we're, when we're trying to select thermal tolerance, um, there's a lot of good, really nice research out there looking at things like uh, weight gain as a function of environmental conditions, right? And we're using weather station data primarily. Um, again, I, I think there's some question whether or not that weather station data is really that well correlated with the actual temperatures inside the barn. And so we're making a lot of assumptions with those sorts of analyses. One of the approaches that we've really been taking is just the, those direct animal measures. And so... Traditionally, right, the definition of thermotolerance is the ability to maintain core body temperature at euthermia under those heat stress conditions, right? And so really, we want to try to find animals that are better able to do that while maintaining productivity. Now, this is traditionally pretty difficult to do, right? So being able to maintain euthermia under heat stress is negatively correlated with production outcomes. And this is because when you select an animal, based on just that absolute body temperature response, you're actually selecting against metabolism, which is correlated with growth performance or litter output or milk output. You know, you name the measure that you're, that you're looking at from a performance standpoint, it's gonna be linked to that me metabolic rate. So what we did is we actually, we took a different approach to that. So we're still looking at body temperature, but instead of seeing that absolute change, we're actually looking at rate of change as a function of those environmental conditions. And so if we have animals that 
we do have an increase in body temperature, but it increases at a slower rate. We categorize those animals as more thermotolerant, right? And so they're using some other, me- we didn't know at the time, but they're using some other mechanism to help them lose that excess heat, right? And then we have another group that we would characterize as sensitive, one that has a really high slope in terms of their body temperature response relative to to that increase in ambient temperature, right? And so they're not as effective as losing heat. And so we believe that by using that approach, we're actually selecting for improved ability to lose heat, not an improved ability to lose heat gain, which is equated with metabolism. So we, we, we started that out with from a phenotyping standpoint, but then we also wanted to correlate that with the genetics of that animal. And so working with Dr. Luis Brito at Purdue University, we're able to um, I, uh, develop a genomic selection model, right? So a, a heat tolerance heritability index. We find that that heritability of that rate of body temperature increase um, had a heritability of about 0.29, which is moderately to highly heritable. And so we've been selecting animals over, we're on our fourth generation you know, of animals that we've selected. And so Dr. Brito's group has been really instrumental in, in developing these genomic selection models. And so as we move forward, we're, deve- we're selecting just based on genomics. My group has been really characterizing. And what we're finding is that what we're selecting for is animals that are really better able to thermoregulate by changing their behavior. And what we're seeing is animals that can maintain better euthermia. But we're also seeing improvements in things like growth rate in those animals. We and we're seeing increases in litter sizes in those gestating sows as well. So it, it seems to be positive so far. Farm Health Guardian is a proven biosecurity software system that helps you improve compliance and reduce disease risk. Why choose Farm Health Guardian? Automate downtime and health status management for large systems. Get biosecurity breach alerts for trucks and trailers. Prevent unauthorized access to your barns with controlled entry technology and speed up disease investigations with automated traceback reports. Check out what our customers are saying at farmhealthguardian.com. Well, it, it somewhat uh, makes sense biologically. If you're better able to maintain your temperature, you're probably going to have a better outcome in life because, you know, a better temperature generally means I'm oversimplifying, but you, you feel better, right? You know, you you feel like the the things that are extra in life, like reproduction and growth, right? Versus if, if you don't and you're hot and you're miserable and you can't cope with that with some sort of a strategy, well, you're probably not going to be able to put any energy towards anything else because your body is just still trying to fix problem number one, which is my temperature problem. Yeah, exactly. I mean, and, and you know, obviously there's there's always multiple goals when we're trying to select an animal, right? We're trying to, we want animals that perform well, right? I mean, that's, that's the point of animal production. We want to be more efficient. Um, we want to create more products for human consumption, but we really need to balance that with the welfare aspect too of those animals and the health aspect. And so, you know, trying to find that animal in that happy medium, one that's going to perform well, right, maintain that efficiency, but also demonstrate those markers of improved welfare, like being able to maintain euthermia, you know, is important, especially for the sustainability of the industry, right? We need to, we need to ensure good welfare while maintaining that normal level of production. Well, and I applaud what you're doing there because um, the, the more you work in this space, I think the better we're going to be able to quantify welfare through things like euthermia. And the better we can quantify welfare, the better all of us can represent the welfare of the pig. The less fuzzy and emotional that topic gets and the more um, scientific we can get in it, to your point, to improve on, on animal agriculture, which is what everybody in our industry I know wants to do. Jay, it's fascinating stuff. I appreciate uh, what you're doing and I appreciate you coming on and sharing it with our audience today. It's great to be here and nice to talk to you. Thank you. Thanks to our audience. Um, Really appreciate you listening to this episode as well as all the episodes that we put out every single week. If you haven't uh, checked out our website, please go to swinehealthblackbelt.com and take a look at it. We come out with new new episodes every Friday. Um, If you haven't listened to Jay's previous one, please go back through the catalog and and check it out. Uh, A lot of good stuff out there and, and tell a friend. If you like this episode, pass it along to them. For Dr. Jay Johnson, I'm Dr. Clayton Johnson. It's been our pleasure to spend a few minutes here with you. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Hey, everybody. We're always searching for the latest and greatest research to share each week. If you have a swine health related research trial and would like to come on the show and talk about it, share it with us, please feel free to email the research to hello at wisenetics.com. That's H-E-L-L-O at 
W-I-S-E-N-E-T-I-X dot com.